Now, what's the implications for costs then? How can I show you that this has a monetary impact on the costs of the business? So in the second half of this video, I want to, I want to pursue that. And here I have three extra columns now, the total cost, the marginal cost, and the average cost. I'm going to work in euros, and let's assume that there is already a capital slash land cost for the fixed factors of production of 1,000 euros. And let's further assume that labor costs are 200 euros per unit. So the total cost for this firm, when they have no labor, must be 1,000, which is, let me get a better pen because that's not working very well, is it? Let me use this blue pen. 1,000, which is all the capital and land costs. There is no labor cost. Every time they add another worker, the total cost will be rising by 200. We've said that's the cost of a unit of labor. So I can straight away just put in all of these total costs, just increasing it by 200 every time until I get to 2,600, which is 1,600 costs of labor, eight units of labor, plus the thousand of the fixed costs for the land and the fixed capital. Okay, there are total costs. Now here's a bit that people get tripped up on. Marginal costs. This is the marginal cost of making each extra unit of output. Look at the, f we can't calculate the marginal cost of no output, but we can calculate the marginal cost of each of these 20 units of output when one worker was added. Listen to that, each of the 20 units of output when one worker was added. I can see that the, the cost of these 20 units was 200, was 200. That was the change in total cost. So to make these first 20 units, and it's only these first 20 units, there was a cost of 200. So the marginal cost per unit is the 200 of extra costs divided by the 20 units, 200 divided by 20, in other words, the marginal cost, very messy there, the marginal cost is 10. Okay, that's 10, is 10 euros is the marginal cost of each of the first 20 units. And the marginal cost of each of these next 34 units, when total output went from 20 to 54, by the addition of another worker, is 34 extra units divided by the extra cost, 200. So, uh, sorry, 200 extra cost divided by 34 units is approximately 6. Marginal cost is falling. It's a difficult point to grasp, but you must see that for the extra 200 of cost, now 34 units were made. So I can say that for each of the 21st to the 54th units of output, each cost six extra euros to make. Those 34 units were cheaper to make than these 20 units. Because at first, we don't have diminishing um, marginal returns, we don't have increasing cost, we have uh, increasing returns to scale and they are cheaper and that's why a marginal cost curve will start to fall. I can't tell you, I don't have enough information about the different marginal costs for each one of these units. All I can say is that these 34 units were produced at an extra cost of 200 in total, so per unit it's 200 divided by 34 which is just under 6, but I've rounded to six. Indeed, I've rounded all of these numbers to the nearest whole number for ease of explanation. You can see that the next um, marginal cost, which will be for all each one of all the units from the 55th unit to the 100th unit, will be 200 extra cost divided by each of those 46 units. Okay, and that's somewhere between four and five. Let's just say I'm, I'm, something like four and a half. And here, well, very roughly, it's, it's, it's round about 200 divided by 50, it's round about 4. But when this diminishing marginal returns occurs, we, we see a rising marginal cost. You see, the extra 200 of cost didn't produce as many extra units of output. And so each of those units of output must have cost more per unit. If I take that through further, you'll see what I mean. The next 200 of costs only produced an extra 33. It's roughly six. And the next 200 of cost 
only produced about 20, 21 units, it's roughly 10. And the next 200 of cost only produced nine uh, extra units of output, and it's something like 21 euros for each of those nine. Those nine units were very expensive to produce per unit. This, an extra worker, an extra 200 of cost, only gave us nine extra units. So each one of those nine were very, was very expensive. That's why the marginal cost curve at first falls and then rises. So the law of diminishing returns has taught us that, that if we keep adding a variable factor of production to a fixed quantity of other factors of production, we can't expect each extra uh, variable factor of production to produce more and more and more bigger and bigger extra amounts. It turns eventually, less extra is produced. That's the signal for the firm that they should be expanding their um, whatever has been fixed. In this case, it was capital and land. They can't expect to keep increasing the output by just throwing more and more labor into the, into the equation. And they must realize that the cost of these extra units that are being squeezed out by an extra unit labor are very high. The marginal cost is very high. Of course, the average cost, finally, is just total cost divided by quantity. Um, so uh, here it's 1,200 divided by uh, 20. Sorry, yes, 20. Here it's 1,400 divided by 54, and so on. And you could work that one out for yourself. So the law of diminishing returns explains the short-run phenomenon of falling but then rising costs. Um, and that, that really is an explanation for the shape of the MC curve. OK, of course, it, once they move into the long run, they may achieve uh, economies or diseconomies of scale, but that's when all of those factors of production are variable, and that's the condition for the long run. So, I hope that, that hasn't confused you too much. I hope that's ex nicely uh, explained to you the, uh, the, the law of diminishing returns. Okay? Okay? Thank you. Bye-bye.